Okay, today, uh, as we've said, we're going to talk about dementia in the brain. This is certainly not a comprehensive presentation of everything about the brain or everything about dementia, or that might be related to a dementia diagnosis. We would all, including me, have a gigantic headache if I attempted to do that. The goal today, though, is to provide you with some information that's understandable and I hope easy to follow on changes that occur in the brain when someone has dementia and how those changes impact what you see on a day-to-day -day basis. This is an umbrella with the word dementia on it. There's a reason for that. We're gonna talk about exactly what dementia is as a starting point. Dementia is an umbrella term used to describe a group of symptoms that affect cognitive skills or how, how well our brain works. Many people use the words dementia and Alzheimer's interchangeably, but they really aren't the same thing. Dementia, Alzheimer's is a kind of dementia. Dementia in itself is a description of symptoms, not a diagnosis. Dementia affects somewhere between 17 and 25 million people worldwide. And one study that I've read says that dementia is a more feared diagnosis than a cancer diagnosis. When we talk about dementia affecting cognitive skills, let's talk a minute about exactly what cognitive skills are. This is a list of some of the cognitive skills, some of which are self-explanatory. In general, cognitive skills is the way in which a person thinks, processes and responds to information received from the environment. That information is gathered through our five senses of sight, hearing, taste, smell, and touch. Some cognitive skills are thinking, remembering, problem solving, finding the words to express our thoughts, and understanding the words that other people say. Getting started on a task. Let me give you an example of that, that we see in dementia. Have you seen a person who has dementia sit down at the table and not pick up a fork, but just sit there? They don't understand anymore how to start the task of eating. The same thing happens with putting on clothes and bathing sometimes. There's not a starting place, so the person just sits and waits. Cognitive skills also include controlling impulses. Controlling impulses might mean that I don't hit you when I have an urge to do so. They also include reading, following directions, decision-making, using good judgment, which means that I know what kind of clothes are appropriate for the weather outside today, or I know whether I can really afford to buy that expensive item given my financial status. Cognitive skills also include planning, analyzing, and adapting to new situations. So what else is dementia? Dementia affects memory, thinking, and social abilities severely enough to interfere with daily life. The activities of daily life are usually divided into two broad categories, either activities of daily living, which are referred to as ADLs, or instrumental activities of daily living. Activities of daily living include such things as bathing oneself, dressing, groom, grooming, toileting, and transferring from one surface to another. Instrumental activities of daily living include the ability to manage finances, drive safely, navigate public transportation, use the phone, manage medication, do housework and basic home maintenance.
there are at least 50 different kinds of dementia. Actually, this number varies depending on your source. I've seen one article that says there are 10 kinds of dementia and another that says that there are over 100 kinds. Generally speaking, most articles will say, most research will say that there's between 50 and 80 different kinds of dementia. Regardless of the exact number that we use though, the fact that there are a lot of different kinds of dementia is a surprise for most people, as is the fact that some causes of dementia-like symptoms are reversible. Dementia as we usually think of it is most often the symptom of what's called a neurodegenerative disease. The term neurodegenerative means that a part of the nerve system or the neurological system is not working as it should be. In this case, we're talking about the brain. The diseases that are neurodegenerative are Alzheimer's, frontotemporal dementia, corticobasal degeneration, to name a few of the dementias. While all dementias include some degree of memory loss, memory loss by itself doesn't mean that a person has dementia. Other physical conditions that can mimic dementia include such things as depression, brain tumors, head injuries, nutritional deficiencies, hydrocephalus or too much spinal fluid in the brain, infections such as AIDS, meningitis or syphilis, drug reactions and thyroid problems. These are treated differently from dementia and some of these conditions can be fully resolved so that a person returns to what was a normal state for them. The difference between what can be treated and what's neurodegenerative is one reason that it's so important to have a complete medical workup before a diagnosis of some kind of neurodegenerative disorder or dementia is made. What kinds of specific entities fall under the umbrella of dementia? Alzheimer's is the dementia that's most frequently heard about and talked about by most people. It accounts for about 60 to 70% of all dementias. And again, as I go through these um, percentages, there's disagreement about exactly what they are. So roughly this amount. Vascular dementia accounts for about 20 to 30% of all cases of dementia. It's caused by a stroke. Strokes can be either obvious or they can be silent. We can have many, many strokes or little strokes in the brain that cause damage and not really realize that we are having those. Strokes are caused by an, either an obstruction of a blood vessel or a hemorrhage of a blood vessel into the brain. Frontal temporal, oh, excuse me, Lewy body dementia includes Parkinson's disease dementia also. Lewy body dementia accounts for 10 to 25% of all dementias. For those people who have Parkinson's disease, about 40% of those people will develop Parkinson's disease dementia. And then there's frontotemporal dementia, which accounts for 10 to 15% of dementia diagnoses. There's one more category we need to talk about though. Mixed dementias occur commonly, particularly in older adults. On autopsy, it has been found that up to 78% of people with dementia had more than one kind of dementia. And that's what mixed dementia means. It is a combination of other kinds of dementia, sometimes just two, sometimes three kinds of dementia. Sometimes there's evidence on autopsy been found that a person has four different kinds of dementia. The most common mixed dementia is one that involves Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. 
I've already said that a thorough workup is needed to determine whether the difficulties a person is having is the result of the, the dementia or of some treated, treatable medical condition that presents with some of the symptoms of dementia. The other reason that a thorough workup is necessary is that various types of dementia progress differently and have somewhat different treatments. And we'll talk more about the treatments later and the progression a little bit. So saying someone has dementia is like saying someone has cancer. Until we know specifically what type of dementia we're talking about, we really have no idea what we might expect and more importantly, how best to treat the symptoms. Having said all this, I'm going to use the term dementia throughout the rest of this presentation as much of what we talk about is common to all forms of dementia. Okay, so let's talk about the brain specifically now. And we're gonna divide that into two sections. We're gonna talk about the structure of the brain and the chemistry that occurs within the brain. And we'll start with some general information just to remind us how important the brain is. The brain is one of the largest and most complex organs in the body. It's the command center for the entire nervous system. And as such, it's responsible for all of our thought and all of our movement. The adult brain weighs about three to four pounds and it receives 20 to 25% of the blood in the body with each heartbeat. The brain consumes as much as 20% of oxygen and glucose that are taken in by the body on a regular basis. However, when we're thinking intensely, it may use up to 50% of the glucose and oxygen. Wonder how that might be applied for those of us who struggle with weight loss. The brain is made up of more than 100 billion nerves that communicate in trillions of connections called synapses. The brain consists of three major parts, and we're going to look at each of those parts. The first part is the brain stem. The brain stem is about a half an inch in diameter, and it controls all basic activities of the central nervous system, including consciousness, blood pressure, breathing, heart rate, temperature, wake and sleep cycles, digestion, sneezing, coughing, vomiting, and swallowing. Quite a lot of control. All motor control for the body also flows through the brain stem. So damage to the brain stem occurs most often when you have a stroke and that stroke can impair any or all of these functions. There is a very severe type of stroke of the brain stem that produces something called locked in syndrome, which is a condition where survivors can only move their eyes. And you can see how damage to the brain stem at, because of all its functions could cause that kind of um, syndrome to occur. The second part of the brain is the cerebellum. The cerebellum's at the back of the brain low, and it accounts for approximately 10% of the brain volume. It controls posture, coordination, balance, and more complex motor actions such as walking, writing, and speech. Damage to the cerebellum can cause uncoordinated movement, tremors, muscle spasms, slow and slurred speech. The cerebellum can be affected by strokes, multiple sclerosis, or alcohol abuse. And any of the areas of the brain can be affected by trauma, um, so, such as a head injury. So keep that in mind that that always is a possibility for how damage would occur. The cerebrum is the largest part of the brain. It makes up about three fourths of the brain and accounts for approximately 85% of the brain weight. If you look at this picture of the cerebrum, 
and think about other pictures you may have seen of the brain, you will see what looks like cracks and raised areas, or some people describe it as a bunch of noodles stuck together. All of these raised areas and crevices serve to increase the volume of the brain while still ensuring that it fits within the skull. In general, the amount of surface area of the brain correlates with the quality of intellectual functioning. The cerebrum is responsible for higher brain functions like interpreting touch, vision, hearing, and speech. It also plays a role in consciousness, memory, reasoning, language, and social skills. The outer part of the cerebrum is called the cerebral cortex. The cortex is where the most sophisticated intellectual thought processes take place, and it contains two types of tissue. On the surface of the, of the cerebrum is gray matter, which is where most of the information processing takes place. Below that and deeper in the cerebrum is white matter. In the white matter, there are nerves that connect regions of the cerebrum to each other and the cerebrum to other parts of the brain. The brain's also divided into two halves or hemispheres. While the left and right hemispheres usually duplicate each other, they, not all the functions are shared. The left hemisphere does a little more to control speech, comprehension, arithmetic, and writing. And the right hemisphere plays a larger role in awareness of where things are around us, creativity, and artistic and musical skills. The right side of the brain controls the left side of the body and the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body. Therefore, when we see damage to one side of the brain, we usually see the effects of that damage on the opposite side of the body. We see this happen most frequently when someone has a stroke. If damage occurs in the left hemisphere, it frequently causes slurred speech and word finding difficulties whereas damage in the right hemisphere is more likely to cause difficulty locating objects in space or judging distance. Okay, so let's look more in depth at the cerebrum. The cerebrum is divided into four lobes. And again, these lobes occur on each side of the brain. The first lobe we'll talk about is the frontal lobe. It's located behind the forehead and is responsible for many of the higher level thinking skills we use each day. Its management role in these skills is referred to as executive function. The frontal lobe deals with solving problems, setting goals, making decisions, and starting, carrying out, and finishing tasks. It also has an important role in attention and working memory. Working memory is that special memory that we use that allows us to continue to repeat a phone number over and over to ourselves until we can either write it down or dial it. The frontal lobe also governs impulse control, social behavior, motivation, and insight. In addition to the problems in many of these areas we see in dementia, efficient functioning of the frontal lobe is what enables us to see a situation from another person's point of view. Another way to say that is that our ability to empathize with others is controlled by the frontal lobe. This is why explaining to a person who has dementia that his or her actions have been hurtful to you or asking them to do something to make you feel better often doesn't produce the re desired results. Dysfunction in the frontal lobe is common in all types of dementia and may be one of the first signs of Alzheimer's or frontotemporal disorders. The parietal lobe is on the top of the brain behind the frontal lobe. It processes information from our senses about space, perception, and size. The left parietal lobe allows us to tell the left side from the right side and where a limb 
an arm or leg is in front of us. It also plays an important role in reading, writing, and processing numbers. The right parietal lobe help, helps us to work out where objects are in relation to each other and to ourselves. It helps us to organize spatial information such as drawing or setting the table in a correct way. Think about the request to draw a clock as part of dementia testing. That is in part testing the function of the right parietal lobe. The temporal lobe is located roughly above the ears. It processes parts of memory, including recognition of faces and objects, and also helps with language. The outer part of the temporal lobes is where we store general knowledge, which is a type of long-term memory. The left temporal lobe deals with facts, meanings of words, and names of objects, and is central to understanding speech and talking. The right temporal lobe deals with visual material, such as recognizing familiar objects and faces. Damage to the temporal lobes can cause an individual to forget people closest to them and lose the emotional memories associated with loving and caring about those people. Remember when we talked about the differences in the right and left hemispheres of the brain? One of the skills that resides in the right part of the brain is musical ability. Specifically, that skill is located in the right temporal area. For some reason that we don't fully understand, the part of the temporal lobe where this skill resides is spared in most types of dementia. That is why we hear stories and see videos on social media of people whose dementia has progressed to the point that they have difficulty producing any speech, but can still sing along with all the words to a familiar song. Perhaps unfortunately, our memory of racial slurs, sex talk and curse words is also stored in the same area as musical memory. Does that help you understand why someone who has dementia may begin to use four letter words that they would otherwise have been too embarrassed to even think in the past? Deep in the temporal lobes is a system called the limbic system. That system links the brain stem and the cerebral hemisphere. It is what is call, often called part of the primitive brain. It plays a role in emotions, particularly those that evolved early and that play an important role in survival. It helps the body to respond to these intense emotions, especially those of fear and anger by activating a fight or flight response. One of the structures in the um, limbic system is the hippocampus. It plays an important role in memory, learning, and storage and retrieval of long-term information. It also helps to perform, to form sensory memories, such as when smelling an apple or feeling warm beach air reminds you of a long ago summer. Another structure in the limbic system is the amygdala. The amygdala helps the brain process emotion and attaches emotional meaning to memories. Emotional memory is called that because most of our memories in fact do have an emotional component. It also helps the brain to form fear-based memories. Damage to the limbic system is common in most forms of dementia. It may change the way a person feels or would normally react to things. A person may feel more excited, anxious, sad, or apathetic than before they develop dementia. Damage to the limbic system can also lead an individual to have delusions or strongly held belief about things that aren't true. For example, believing that a stranger is in the house or that someone is stealing from them. The fourth lobe of the brain is the occipital lobe. It's located at the back of the head and is the brain's smallest lobe. This lobe processes visual information and interprets what the eyes see. 
the eyes can be functioning perfectly fine and people still can't see when there's damage to the occipital lobe because the brain can't interpret the images. When that happens, it's referred to as cortical blindness. This loss of vision often results in vivid hallucinations. And there's one type of dementia that actually affects the occipital lobe more than any other lobe early on. And that is a subtype of Alzheimer's called PCA or primary cortical atrophy. Vision narrows in general as dementia progresses. Peripheral vision are those, your ability to see to the side is lost and your visual scales narrow to binocular vision. That means you can see about what you can see with binoculars. If you have on binoculars, you can only see what you're looking straight at. That means you can't see food on a plate if you're looking straight ahead. You can't see an object or person beside of you and consequently don't know someone's there or can't find the object and think it's lost. Eventually, a person living with dementia may see only from one eye because putting images together from both eyes is too difficult for the brain to handle. When that happens, the individual loses depth perception. And you may see individuals trying to pick up patterns that are enclosed or tablecloths, or if there's a printed tablecloth on the table when they're eating, they may take their fork and try to stab whatever's in the print, thinking that it is an object. Okay, the cells in the brain are basically divided into two types. On this graphic, the neurons are those cells that are yellow and green. They're the basic functional unit of the nervous system and they generate electrical signals which transmit information over long distances very quickly. Information is passed on from one cell or neuron to another across a synapse, which is the blue area on the graphic. The other cell that's important is the glia. And these are pink or purple on the graphic. The glia cells serve a supporting role for neurons. Several different types of glial cells exist in the brain, but one type acts as scavengers to clean up debris, toxin, and metabolites from dead and injured cells. They also remove excess proteins that are thought to be linked to Alzheimer's disease. Glial cells do much of their work at night when a person is asleep. Think about what that means in terms of cleaning up garbage in the brain when someone has disruption of their sleep cycles. Okay, let's focus on the synapse of a neuron. The synapses don't touch each other. There's a space in between one neuron and another. And they're chemicals that transmit signals from one of those nerve cells to another across that synapse, and those are called neurotransmitters. Acetylcholine is one of the brain's natural neurotransmitters. It plays a critical role in the formation of memories, verbal and logical reasoning, and the ability to concentrate. Acetylcholine generally excites cells activates muscles and supports wakefulness. Acetylcholine also offers some protective benefits and may limit the neurological decay associated with degenerative diseases. If acetylcholine stays in the snaps, the cells would be firing all over the brain at the same time and our head would probably explode. So there is another chemical called acetylcholinesterase, 
that takes up the acetylcholine and clears the way for the next messages. And I meant to only underline erase on this slide so that it helped remind you what acetylcholinesterase does, but I got a little carried away with that. All brain cells are damaged or killed by dementia. And as this happens, less acetylcholine is reduced, is produced. In addition, the death of brain cells causes the brain to shrink overall. Brain cells die and the size of the brain decreases in all kinds of dementia. This is a comparison of an Alzheimer's brain to a normal brain. This is an example of a brain of a person at a severe stage of Alzheimer's. And it is about one third of the size of the healthy adult brain. But the brain tissue doesn't shrink symmetrically. Shrinkage is due to cell death. So holes in brain tissue are erratic. And you can see that better on the right-hand side of the slide. The shrinkage of the brain is also the reason that falls are much more catastrophic for people with dementia. As the brain gets smaller within the bony skull, any hit to the head means that the brain, the brain bounces around more and thus is more apt to be damaged with falls. Okay. So we have damaged and dying cells that produce less acetylcholine and that make the synapses across which the acetylcholine must travel get further apart. In addition, the acetylcholinesterase continues to function as it normally would. This picture should help you understand why sometimes a person who has dementia can do something or remember something, and sometimes they can't. It depends on whether that acetylcholine is being produced in large enough quantities at that moment to make it across that synapse to the next neuron so that the message can be carried forward. Let's talk about how to increase the amount of neurotransmitters and acetylcholine is only one. It plays, as I've said, a critical function in the formation of memories, verbal and logical reasoning and the ability to concentrate and excites cells in general. One of the frontline treatments for most types of dementia are cholinesterase inhibitors. They work by slowing down the process that breaks down acetylcholine they inhibit that acetylcholinesterase. And those medications are denepazil or Aricept, galantamine or Razadine, and rivastigmine or Exelon. Dopamine is another of the neurotransmitters in the brain. It plays a role in how we perceive pleasure and in movement. It also plays a part in motivation to learn and motivation to meet new people. Decreased dopamine is a hallmark of Parkinson's disease. Typically, it is treated with levodopa, uh, which increases the production of dopamine, but some of the second generation drugs used for depression, particularly venlafaxine or effexor when given at a higher dose can also have some effect on increasing dopamine. Another neurotransmitter is glutamate. Glutamate plays a role in learning and forming memories. It too excites cells. It's present in 90% of all synapses in the brain, but too much of it can kill neurons. Memantine or Namenda is a medication that helps regulate glutamate. And just as a note, Namzeric, which is one of the newer drugs, is a combination of denepazil and memantine. So it increases the available acetylcholine and glutamate both. Another of the neurotransmitters 
is serotonin. Serotonin is sometimes called the happy chemical because it contributes to happiness and a sense of well being. There are medications called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which means that they keep those entities that break down serotonin from working. Examples of those that are, re and they're referred to as SSRIs, are escitalopram or Lexapro, sertraline or Zoloft, and citalopram or Celexa. Another of the neurotransmitters is GABA or GABA aminobutyric acid. GABA inhibits the activities of neurons so that it decreases stress and anxiety. It's used for nerve pain and the treatment of, of seizures and also used in dementia because of its calming effect. GABA is available as a supplement but research shows that, not, that it may not enter the brain when given as a supplement. The most common form of GABA we see prescribed is gabapentin or neurontin. Benzodiazepines like Valium, Clonopin, Xanax, and Ativan can increase GABA but they are generally contraindicated in individuals with dementia. And we will talk more about that contraindication in a later class. So what happens with the brain and dementia? How would we summarize all of this? It's certainly more than memory loss. With dementia, both the structure of the brain and the chemicals that make the brain function change. This leads to more than memory loss. It in fact leads to brain failure. I hope that helps you understand again why you may see very different behavior from an individual from what you expect during dementia. The brain is failing and there's no way to know which part will fail at which point in time or which part works sometimes and not other times. There are two additional resources that I want um, to make you aware of. Both are YouTube videos by Tipa Snow. You may be able to access them through these links or you can find them on YouTube simply by putting in Tipa Snow and the names of either of these videos. They will give you more information and said in a little different way about how the brain functions and what kinds of issues you see based on that in your person living with dementia. Thank you.